pick up where we are. So first, let me just thank everybody for taking a few minutes out of your uh, day this morning to uh, join the Alabama Emergency Response Commission meeting for October 2022. That was my phone. And uh, so we do, if you want to go ahead and bring up the agenda real quick, Beth. So this agenda we're going to look at for today, we'll have our agency updates. We do have two people that will be talking to us today. We appreciate uh, both for being here. That will be Sissy Jacobs. She will be talking to us about the LEPC handbook. She is with EPA. And we have tried to get Sissy on a few times, but due to some uh, logistical issues with the handbook being released, we had to kind of hunt, but we were finally able to get her here. So we appreciate that. And then also Hub Harvey, who probably many of y'all know with Shelby County EMA, he will be here to discuss the Colonial Pipeline incident from 2016. That was also something that we'd wanted kind of maybe to discuss earlier, but due to some uh, litigation type issues and things of that nature, we kind of had to push that off a little while, but, but we will have Hub here this morning. And my name is Grady Springer. I'm with the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. I am the Emergency Response Coordinator in Montgomery and serve as one of the co-chairs for the CERC and I'll let Beth introduce herself and she needs to say anything she can. My name is Beth Whitson. I'm the Serial Title III coordinator for the state so I process all the emergency planning and community right to know act paperwork for the whole state and um, I'm an environmental scientist at ADEM. Uh, we have a few housekeeping things. Um, if you look on your uh, screen make sure that your mic is muted um, if you're not actively speaking, that way we don't get any feedback. And for those of you that have just joined us, if you will go ahead and type your name and your agency in the chat box uh, so that we can record your attendance. Um, under updates and reports, we have uh, Pam Cook speaking at AMA. I do not see her on the call. Pam, are you with us this morning? Okay, and we also were supposed to have uh, Debbie Link with AEMA to speak about the HMEP grant. Um, Debbie, are you on the line with us? So it looks like we're going to go ahead and skip those two and go straight into Grady Springer's RRT update and the, and the update for ADEM. So let me go ahead and progress these slides. And, and Grady, you can go ahead and begin. Okay, thanks, Beth. And that that was actually Pam that just tried to call me a second ago, so she may be having some issues. Uh, when I when I run through this, I'll try to reach out to her, and we can circle back around to those updates if needed. So what we're going to do real quick is take a look at our emergency response numbers uh, for the last two quarters, or essentially since that we last met as a CERT. And these numbers are based off uh, st our statewide numbers for all four of our field offices. Each one of those field offices has an emergency response component in a particular area of the state that they are responsible for responding in. So we had a total of 100, 145 release notifications. Now, I do want to specify that as notifications to us. That is not necessarily uh, everyone that we responded to. We generally try to give the local government, the local first responders, um, you know, first option to try to mitigate that incident. And of course, if they get to a point for them that it gets outside of their scope to handle, they can request state assistance and we will uh, be happy to assist them how we can on site. So of those 145, we did respond on site to 37 of those. So we we basically filled 37 on site responses for the last two quarters. And this is the breakdown of the numbers, kind of what our responses look like. Uh, and per the norm, the, the largest impacts were land uh, land based of, or land impacts for notifications. Uh, and the majority of those are going to be transportation type incidents, some railway incidents, uh, but that's obviously the, the largest majority of things that we feel. I will tell you that as far as water impacts or impacts to water, that that was kind of a spike this this last two quarters. Generally, that number is somewhere around the eight to nine percent of our responses, but for whatever reason, that kind of jumped up uh, for this reporting period with a total of 28. And then Per the norm, our smallest uh, notifications came from air responses. And I do want to specify when I say air response, I'm not necessarily talking about um, reportable, reportable releases from facilities that goes that is part of their permitting process. I'm more or less talking about uh, natural gas releases, some chlorine releases, things like that that should not be 
uh, are not per permitted to happen, but do occur. So that's that's kind of what we we are looking at from the emergency response uh, side when we talk about air air releases. And we were fortunate enough not to have any of those releases be classified as anything we would consider major. We did have one incident that did require um, some EPA assistance from Region 4, and that was from Chambers County, and that was actually about two weeks ago. So we received notification on September 22nd that there was an unidentified possible hazardous material that had been discovered in a barn. Uh, essentially what happened is we had um, an entity that had bought a property with a uh, an old barn on it, and their goal, I think, was to repurpose this barn for some other issues. And this was a fair, like I said, fairly old barn. So as what is the norm with these barns, it had a lot of things just accumulated in over the decades. So as this entity began trying to clean this barn out, they came across a couple of bags with some type of unknown material, powder material but it was labeled cyanide. So at that point they did back out and they contacted the local hazmat and the local Chambers County EMA, who in turn contacted ADEM and um, uh, AEMA. And at that point we requested that the uh, county EMA go ahead and make a notification through the NRC so we could kind of bring in uh, EPA on that side. So once that NRC was filed, we reached out to EPA told them what we had or that we needed some assistance trying to identify the, what this material was, if it truly was a cyanide based material or something else. So they arrived on scene the following day, uh, EPA and a star contractor, and they began doing field tests and taking samples. Of course, they isolated the material off in this particular area of the barn, uh, kind of brought some safety procedures in place and then began their, uh, their testing. And the field test came back as this was not a cyanide based material. So that was good news for everyone on the scene. However, it was not 100% conclusive. So they did pull some lab, some lab samples. Uh, those were submitted and run over the uh, weekend. In the meantime, this, this barn did remain corned off to any general public and the, the material isolated. So when those lab samples came back, which was last Wednesday, they did indicate there was no cyanide based material in this. However, it was a fertilizer and pesticide based material, which did have some uh, some hazardous materials for pesticide, namely DDT and DDD. So what ultimately happened is that after this um, analyzation and some discussion with the county EMA and with the owner of this property, uh, it was granted that this material could be bagged up just using level C um, going in and bagging up with a respirator and it was sent to a landfill for a household hazardous waste so it was able to be managed to uh, just a household hazardous waste rather than uh, something as serious as cyanide and that concluded that once that disposal occurred uh, with epa if you can advance it real quick Beth. and then just for the rrt update regional response team uh, there's unfortunately really nothing to to update here, just as the case was the last AERC meeting. Uh, just as a recap, last time we were able to meet in person was in February of 2020. That was uh, right before COVID really hit everywhere. We tried to meet a few times virtually. Uh, so the last time we met virtually as an RT was February of 2021, but we have since not met that the virtual uh, meeting, you know, generally that's about a, a three day conference and it was just really difficult to try to get all the presentations and all the different on hand things done virtually. So after that last meeting in 2021, we held off and currently we are at a, I guess, an indefinite hold on the RT next meeting. We don't currently have anything scheduled. Typically we meet in August. We did not have scheduled anything for that. So we're waiting to see if, if and when we re reconvene as an RT. Hopefully that will be soon. And if there are any questions about any of that, I'll be glad to take them. And if not, we can move forward with yours, Beth. You can either uh, take your mic off mute and ask the question, or you can type it in the chat box, whichever one's easier for you. And it appears that some people are having trouble with the Eventbrite link, Grady. Um, I sent two people an email. It was also posted in the agenda, but Fred just stopped by my office and he said that he couldn't get in either. So that may be why some of the attendance is not great. I'm not sure what the disconnect is with the link, but 
um, hey, hopefully. Hey, Beth, go ahead. This yeah. is Paul, uh, DHR. Yeah, I had a problem logging in until it actually started. I could call in on the phone, but I had to wait till it was going on for about a minute or two before it was accepted. Okay. Okay. Should I try to resend out the agenda with the link in it, Grady? Um, you can try it real quick, and I will. If you want to, I guess if you want to carry on a report, you can send it, and I'll try to contact Pam real quick, see if they could get in. Okay. Um, and let's see. Let me do this. Um, I should have the reminder that I sent out to everyone just a minute ago. Um, Somebody said they had two different meeting codes. I had a problem in the beginning as well. Okay. Um, let me just send out the inv the uh, invitation reminder again, uh, which was sent out last week. That would have the link in the meeting. Um, and that might help people get in. Uh, so if you'll give me just one second and then um, I'll do my update right after I do that. It should just take me a second to find this email. Uh, Trent, I saw your request. Yeah, we'll get you added to the distro list uh, for next time. That way you can get it directly. Okay, I found the email. Let me forward this to everyone. One more second, I'm almost there guys, and then we'll continue and proceed with the meeting. Okay, hey Beth, yeah, I just talked with Pam. She said um, she was having some trouble and Hub Harvey was having some trouble getting in. She said they clicked the link and it would bring them in, but would not bring them into the meeting. Okay, um, let me copy all these. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I've resent that. Um, so we should be good to go with that. Hopefully people will be able to get back in. Um, somebody said the Teams chat meeting is not working for them and sent their um, Justin McKenzie with Fire Chief. He's the Fire Chief of Fultondale, and Amy Reed is the Administrative Assistant for Fultondale Fire. They are on the call with us. Uh, thank you, Carl, for posting the uh, link to get into the chat. Um, okay, we'll proceed onward. Uh, sorry for all the technical difficulties today, guys. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, so, for those of you just joining us, I'm Beth Woodfin. I work for the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. I'm the Sarah Title III Coordinator, and I, pro I uh, process all the emergency planning and community right to know documents that come in across the state. For the 2021 Tier 2 season, uh, the Tier 2 report is a hazardous chemical inventory that facilities who meet a certain threshold are, are required to report the types of chemicals, the amount, those chemicals that are on site and where those chemicals are stored. They're required to submit those tier two forms every year to their Alabama Emergency Response Commission, their local emergency planning committee and their local fire departments. Uh, for tier two submit, which is the free EPA program, we had 1,835 facilities file for Alabama this year. And in ePlan, we had 1,909. 
And I believe this is the first time that we've had more submissions in ePlan than we did uh, to Tier 2 Submit. Um, so this, these numbers reflected here, the 3,744 is the total number of Alabama facilities that filed for 2021. Um, that number is about 70 more than the last time we met back in March. So we had about 70 late filers who filed um, since the last meeting. We had a couple of regulatory updates that I'm not going to go into too much detail on. I just wanted to provide the links for those that may be interested in these regulatory updates. The Chemical Safety Board released a guidance document on accidental release reporting. This mainly applies to facilities that have had a, a somewhat catastrophic release where there was a loss of life, uh, serious damage to the property or serious damage to the environment. Um, and the CSB um, has all the new updates in that link right there on the first bullet point. The EPA also developed a fact sheet for EPCA reporting requirements for fertilizer retails, which is uh, exciting for me anyway, because we get a lot of questions about uh, fertilizer re retailers, and there's some exemptions for, um, for farmers and for agriculture, and so it's, it's really nice that they did this update to include more specific details about who is exempt and who isn't exempt. Uh, the last update I wanted to touch on is the risk management program. They are trying to pass a safer communities by chemical accident pre um, prevention proposed rule. I know that's a mouthful. Um, they're basically trying to modify and add a rule to the RMP plan that already exists um, to make uh, repeat uh, people that re repeatedly have releases have uh, stricter requirements for making those uh, releases happen less frequently and to protect the community a little bit better. So if you have any interest uh, in those releases, I mean, excuse me, in those updates, you can click on those links, which we'll send out at the end of the presentation today. Um, we'll send the uh, slides out with the minutes, that way everyone can have the links to the slides. Um, if anybody has any EPCA questions for me, you can ask them now, uh, whether you're a facility or here or uh, just someone who has a Tier 2 question or an EPCA question. Um, I've also posted the links for ePlan, which is the free online reporting software that the first responders can access for free. Um, they don't have to use it, but it is a tool that can be used. I also put a link to the Cameo Suite, which is EPA's free software through the computer-aided management of emergency operations software, uh, which lets you do uh, route planning and evac planning and several different things in one module. So if you have any questions about ePlan or Cameo, hit me up and let me know. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our new business. First, we're going to have uh, Sissy Jacob with the EPA talk about our national, local hey, emergency. Uh, Go ahead. I think we were able to get some uh, AEMA people in. We do apologize for that little glitch. I, I'm assuming it was Teams but or Eventbrite, but I think we do have them in now if we want to circle back around um, to those reports. Sure. Uh, let's go back to the LEPC update. This is just a placeholder. Pam's email is down at the bottom. Pam Cook is with AEMA. Are you with us, Pam? Hi. Thank you. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, information to update on the LEPCs. We are, you know, revamping them, going out, attending meetings in person if we can. A lot are still doing virtual, but we're attending as we as we are able. I am also reaching out to all the LEPCs to make sure that their point of contact is still correct and that what exercises they've done and if their plans, what's the status of their plans? Are they updated? They're going to be updated in a year? You know, all the information that we put on our website as it relates to LAPCs. Um, and of course, the handbook that um, EPA sent out was forwarded to all the LAPCs for them to um, see the updates and use accordingly. And um, I think that's it, Beth, unless there's any questions. 
Thank you, Pam. I appreciate the update. I'm going to go back here. Um, is Debbie Link with us? She is also with AEMA. She is going to do an HMEP grant update. I'm here, Beth. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, for HMAP uh, funding status, uh, the last open subaward application period for the counties was February 2022 to April 2022. Uh, this, there were several awards issued for that funding, and they were issued in June uh, for approved projects, which are commodity flow studies and exercises related to hazmat. Uh, transport. Um, the period of performance for those is October 1, 2022 to September 30, 2023. So it's for the current fiscal year, and that is related to the funding that we just received uh, the end of last month. So that funding is issued to to the state every year, and then we'll do the sub awards every year uh, for the counties. And of course, um, uh, Fire College gets some of that funding as well. The next open application period for the counties will be the same time frame in FY23. So the count will send that out to all, all counties. That's, that's the way it has um, been done the last few years. I'm not sure before that, but it goes out. That information goes out to all counties in the state, and then they respond with um, completed applications, and then the applications are, are processed uh, for approval. And uh, I think that's everything I have right now related to the status uh, for HMEP. So we're not really in a um, act, in an active mode right now on that. Just that the counties who uh, were awarded those funds are getting ready to start their projects. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Debbie, thanks for that update. Would you mind um, typing in the chat box those dates um, for so we can put those in the minutes for when we send out the minutes afterwards? I think that would be really helpful to have that uh, in writing so that I don't type something incorrectly. Um, if you wouldn't yep. mind doing that, Debbie, that would be amazing. I will. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Debbie or Pam? Oh, I'm about to advance the slide uh, to the new agenda. Thomas, are you still having slide issues? It's good to say agenda replied, new no, business. It's yeah, okay. it's just sitting there at one of 10, so, but I, I'll get them when you send out the slides. Okay. Uh, so for our new business, we have Sissy Jacob with the EPA, who's gonna discuss the National Local Emergency Planning Committee handbook. We're the link to that will be on this slide. So if you haven't seen it yet, we have sent it out a few times now, but if you haven't seen it yet, it is on this slide. So you can pull that when we send them out at the end of the meeting. Uh, Sissy, I'm gonna mute myself and you um, can take over the presentation. Let me see. I'm gonna click stop sharing and then I think you should be able to request control of the slides. Oh, let me not do that. Um, okay, Sissy, I think you should be able to share. Um, if you click on the share button to the left of the leave button, you should be able to share whatever you'd like to show. Can you see that? I can. You'll want to uh, start the presentation. It looks like it's on the actual. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right, we can see it. Thank you, Sissy. Um, hi, uh, my name is Sissy Jacob. I'm with the EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm with the Office of Emergency Management. And within that office, we have uh, several div different divisions. And I'm in the Regulation Implementation Division in the chemical branch. I am the EPCRA non-313 program manager. I have over 30 years of experience in EPCRA and is implementing regulations. My career in EPCRA started way back in the late 80s when I joined the uh, call center that supports this program. 
as a contractor. Then I moved over to New Jersey State with a Title V permit and surface water inspection. Now, then I came back to EPA in 97. So since then, I've been managing the program. And it's, uh, thank you for inviting me to join this meeting. I, I should say you are the first state that asked me to join uh, the, the CERC meeting, so which I'm excited about. So I'm going to turn off my video, so I won't stare at myself <laughs> given this presentation. OK, so um, I know that the, uh, the agenda says the, to do a presentation on um, national LEPC TPC handbook. Um, but however, I wanted to like do a quick. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't work. Thing. Ah. Oh my goodness. OK, so I don't understand why. It doesn't let me advance the slide. I have this problem all the time. Um, would you know why? Hmm. Ah, there you go. Took a minute. OK, so um, I just want to do a quick overview of APCRA for anyone that is here new to attending um, or new to the program. So the purpose of APCRA is to protect, prepare and protect the community, including first responders from chemical accidents. In addition, uh, APCRA was created. Um, the community right to know part um, uh, have the you know uh, key to providing access to potential hazards to the citizens in the community. Okay, and for that reason, uh, Congress created the uh, implementing agencies at the heart of where all the uh, facilities are located in each community, and uh, you all hold the key to success of the APCA program. Uh, the SERCs, TURCs, LEPCs, and TEPCs. Okay. Um, other stakeholders uh, in, in um, uh, making sure that the EPCRA program is successful is EPA and the facilities. Uh, first of all, there's the facilities that has reported the presence and releases of hazardous substances and extremely hazardous substances, and also report uh, the hazardous chemical in um, chemicals present on site and the toxic chemical release um, information. Okay, and EPA publishes regulations and the list of chemicals, and we provide technical assistance to um, EPA, sorry, um, to the state, tribal, local agencies, as well as the regulated community. So of those four groups, uh, LEPCs and TPCs are the key players. Um, they are, um, the Congress made sure that um, it said in the statute that at least a representative from each of these organizations should be on the um, LEPC and TPC organizations. As you can see, facility owners and operators mm -hmm. also hold a um, major part in making sure that local emergency plans are, um, you know, developed or they hold they assist LEPCs and TPCs to develop the plan and participate in the community plan. Okay, okay so why are LEPCs and TPCs important? They, develop, they have to develop the statute mandate that uh, LEPCs and TPCs develop emergency response plan for, the, for each community and explain potential chemical risks to the community and explain what to do in the case of emergencies. So this has to be explained to the citizens because some of them do not know what to do. And, um, you know, there are EJ populations as well as people who are disabled. Um, they need to know what to do in case of an emergency with chemicals perhaps, in their community. OK, so there are four major provisions. I'm not going to go into detail on each of them because uh, I would need an hour for each of these because each of these provisions under EPCRA has different requirements, a different set of chemicals and reporting thresholds. So our office, Office of Emergency Management, we only manage EPCRA sections 302 to 312. 
the 313, the TRI chemical uh, reporting that is managed by another office in EPA, Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, the TRI office, okay? So um, in addition to the 1986 uh, EPCA requirements, Congress enacted the uh, America's Water Infrastructure Act in 2018, placing additional responsibility to the CERCs and TURCs and LAPCs to provide notification or share uh, chemical inventory data with the community water systems. Uh, the reason for that um, act and the amendments to EPCRA section 304 and 312 was due to a chemical release that happened in West Virginia uh, by Freedom Industries. Uh, it affected drinking water intake of thousands of residents in that city. So that's why this uh, uh, amendments were uh, passed in 2018. So this is just a summary of all the provisions of EPCRA. Um, that, uh, that, you know, the facility, what facilities are required to do under each of the provisions uh, from 302 to 312, and what LEPCs and SERCs are required to do with this information. Um, basically, uh, anything that facility submits will um, either are used to develop emergency response plan or and conduct exercises. And in addition, um, to pro provide that information to the public that requests the information. Okay, so now we uh, go into the topic of um, the agenda that, I mean, topic that is presented on the agenda. Uh, the National LEPC TPC Handbook. So back in the early days of EPCRA program, I don't know if anybody knows Steve Mason from Region Six. He started. He developed a um, LEPC handbook for the Region Six states. So since then, many states have used outside of the Region Six um, as the National LEPC handbook that he developed. He retired, and um, then 2014 was the last version. So we thought we need to, uh, and we had many requests from states whether we can uh, develop the national LEPC TPC handbook. So this was posted in January 2022. So, um, anyways, um, so there are two parts to this handbook. Part one. Um, it has like the statutory text and the implementation responsibilities for the uh, for CERC, CERCs and LEPCs, LEPCs and TPCs, and it includes this um, the statutory and the regulatory requirements for facilities, and interpretation of the requirements in the state in the state and the statute as well as in the regulations, and we provide uh, several examples um, on this exemptions under each of the sections. And um, it's a great handbook. It's in, uh, um, in, in part, unfortunately, well, it's not unfortunately, it, it, is, it does include all the uh, provisions from 302 to 312. So you can imagine how big this document is. So especially because we are including the statutory text. So um, it will, you know, it's that rather than you all have to go and search we know what part of the EPCRA statute says what. So um, we have all that in this um, uh, lengthy book. Um, it's about 300, no, 200 some pages, but I'm going to give you, no, you don't have to flip through every page. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. So and part two has a guidance and resources for implementing EPCRA. And many of this information in part two was taken uh, were taken from the Region 6 and that I just mentioned earlier. Um, there, there are several examples of how to set up a meeting and, and what to ask facilities. You know, we have so, um, example letters that you can send to the facilities and also to the organizations within the community to join the LEPCs as well. Then we have the appendix and other resources provided in part two. Okay, so part one of the handbook, um, it goes through each of the provisions under EPCRA, and uh, a link is provided in the in the table of contents that a user can 
click and go directly to the uh, that chapter. OK, so you can see the 301, 302, 303, all the way to uh, 326. It doesn't, as I uh, mentioned earlier, it does not include the toxic chemical release inventory reporting, which is in EPCRA section 313. This is just only the um, uh, the the program that Office of Emergency Management uh, uh, implement. Okay, and then at the end of this part one, there is a summary of the EPCRA regulations and the stakeholder responsibilities. It's a, a couple of charts we provide um, for. Uh, you know, for it to get a quick summary on what each of the regulations um, or the statute requires. OK, and part two is the guidance of resources for implementing APCRA and each of the chapters again is provided uh, with a hyperlink so you can directly go to those sections or the chapters that uh, that you wish. And here are the appendices that's included. Like I said earlier, um, there's, um, you know, for example, there's um, a sample bylaws um, or mission statements and how to hold a, um, you know, uh, an effective uh, TEP, um, LEPC meetings um, and the facility questionnaire to obtain additional information for emergency planning. So there are several resources here that uh, LEPCs can use. Um, to get their program back up. I know uh, in the CERC survey um, that you provided in the LAPC spreadsheet that uh, not, uh, several LAPCs that are not active. So I can talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, so these are some of the resources that LAPCs can use to get back into. So again, I want to like emphasize that the facilities in your community are capable of helping you out with um, a, you know, developing emergency response plan or modify the emergency response plan because they know and they, are, they have the technical expertise on the chemicals that they handle. So they can be a great resource um, to even respond to um, incidents or conducting exercises, or they even, may, may even provide uh, response equipment. Um, I've heard from several states that uh, they also provide uh, funding or resources, other resources. So you may want to tap into those, um, you know, that um, to get in touch with, uh, to reach out to the facilities in your planning committee, in your planning district. So they will give you, um, you know, and, and they may be able to, it may be good for their publicity. So to get involved in the LEPC. Um, actually, the statute says that they are required to have a, a representative um, in the LEPC organization. And they're supposed to participate in the local emergency planning. That That is a statutory requirement. So, and um, so you may want to reach out to them if they are not already involved. OK, so and we provide several resources um, like, um, for instance, uh, this EPRO video uh, was produced for like maybe a couple of years ago and posted on our website. Um, there, that is a 15 to 20 minute video. It's an intro intro video for any new members of the CERC or the LAPCs to watch and um, to to learn how important the Yepco statue is, so you can um, uh, provide that information I and mean, provide that video to to the new folks to get you know to get familiar with the Yepco. And we have um, several fact sheets on our web page as well. This is our main Yepco web page, and um, in addition, we have comprehensive online training for the implementing agencies. Um, again, that is a lengthy training. Um, the The handbook was in su as a supplement to the online training. The online training we developed about 10, 12 years ago. Um, but um, again, uh, that training is lengthy, but there is a program embedded in it to take the user to the um, to the training, whatever they whatever they left off, so you don't have to sit through the entire training at once. Okay. Okay. 
and we have uh, provided several um, commodity flow studies um, uh, examples. So several um, are provided in the handbook as well, and um, uh, some sample of LPC emergency plans uh, be included in that um, a link to that report. Okay. Those plans. Okay, so. The search survey responses in the LEPC spreadsheet. Thank you so much for the countless hours that you spend it responding to the survey and LEPC spreadsheet. We really appreciate your effort. Um, this is the first survey uh, that we are conducting. And I got a, an idea after a year was passed that we wanted to know what you know, current practices are on implementing EPGRA. Because at the beginning of the program, National Governance Association, um, they used to publish um, a book called the Stock Profiles. Those who were, um, you know, present back in the day, um, along with, um, you know, people like me, uh, we would have, may have seen that Stock Profiles. Uh, it used to uh, contain all the information how each state has uh, set up the program, EPCA program, and where the funding is coming from, or how the program is run, and whether the circus bylaws, um, all that good information were in those reports, and they lasted from 89 to 1999, and that was the, you know, right, right before September 11th, I mean, a couple of years before September 11th. So, um, you know, if 35 years after EPCA was passed, we wanted to know how the new generation of CERC and LEPC members are running the program and what are your challenges and what are your priorities and how, you know, what how can we assist you in meeting those um, uh, requirements or uh, priorities that you have set uh, within the EPCA program. So that's why we did this, um, you know, I just want to thank, thank again to all the players that uh, you know, uh, responded to the survey and the LEPC spreadsheet, and we really appreciate it. So we're gonna we're planning to publish the report in a few in a few weeks. Um, it's uh, we're meeting. I mean, I'm writing up the survey analysis. Um, it's it then it has to go to the management uh, for review and approval before we publish it. Okay. okay so. These are additional resources. Um, the first one is National LPC Handbook that Beth already uh, posted on the agenda, and the training, online training I just spoke about earlier. Okay, so and uh, if anyone um, have questions or if you need any interpretation of the statute or the regulations, you can uh, contact me. You can email me, and we also have a uh, the a technical information center uh, is a, they are contractors but they provide technical assistance uh, for the facilities as well as implementing agencies on EPCO and implementing regulations um, I worked with a contractor years ago so uh, they are pretty good they are um, they only answer um, you, you know the interpretations as the Office of Emergency Management, or my office, set policies in. So, and if they don't have any answers, they will come back to us. And then, you know, then we will assist in responding to any specific questions that may have. So, so I have. Thank you. Um, any questions? Hey, Sissy, I do. I have two questions for you, real quick. Yeah. And I know you said that the, the survey results they obviously need to be approved and everything, which can take some time, but is there a time frame or any idea when y'all are expecting to have those able for release? I in October. That's uh, so that's, it will be. that's yeah. And we were supposed to have it finished by before the NASTIPO meeting, but I don't know whether we'll make it to that date, um, because the management has to review it and approve before we publish it. But I can say, um, I may share some information at the NASPO meeting, which is on October, I think I'm on the agenda on October 18th. So, okay. yeah. All right. And and as far as any training um, for you mm -hmm. specifically, do you ever work one-on-one -on -one with LEPCs for training or do you generally uh, try to push that through the regional um, 
I guess, training coordinators? Usually it's the regional coordinators, but um, as I said earlier about Natasha being new, um, you can ask her and then maybe she may ask me to do it and I'm willing to, you know, if I have the time because we have a couple of rules that I'm involved in that I had to support the junior staff and the upper program. So um, my plate is overflowed at all the times. <laughs> yeah, but Thank I you. will make time. I'll make time. And, and you know, so yeah, please, I, I will be more than happy to. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Susie, this sure. is Hub Harvey with Shelby County. I got a uh, couple of comments and a question. Can you hear okay. me? Sure, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's Shelby County, obviously Alabama, but one thing that I want to say was, was thank you for uh, pointing out the new version, the January 2022 version of the LEPC TEPC handbook. Uh -huh. We are blessed to have a very active LEPC here in Shelby County. Cool. I said, still too long, my light turned off, sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I want to tell you that I really like this sample response reimbursement letter for the responsible party that's uh -huh. in there. That is really, really good. Appreciate that. One other sure. question I've got is um, the video that you've got in here. Is this an updated version of that video or do you know, or is that the one we've had from years past? Oh, no, this is an updated one two years ago. They needed. Excellent. Yeah, because um, several uh, folks asked us to do a short video because they said, well, the training is too long. You know, for anybody who's new to the program, they need something, you know, short and right to the point. So, yes. So that is like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. All right. I'm uh, sorry. I'm doing multiple things at once because I'm sending no problem. Uh, an email I'm... to the rest of my staff right now saying, <laughs> hey, we need to uh, get that new video on our LAPC uh, agenda for the November meeting that's coming up oh. the second week in November. So cool. um, this is outstanding timing. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, appreciate it. Sure, no problem. Do we have any more questions for Sissy before we move on? Hey, uh, this is Trent from Limestone County. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Trent, we got you. Hey, uh, first I wanted to comment. Uh, we are in the process of reestablishing our LEPC, and the handbook has been very helpful in, in getting that up and going. I've been doing a lot of work to do that and just being able to reference that handbook has been great to to get some information and whatnot. Um, my question is to follow back uh, for the facilities. Um, do, are they aware, educated or anything that they are required to participate? Because uh, one thing that I'm kind of running into is, is we're having some good uh, participation from some of our facilities, but we mm -hmm. don't get responses from other facilities and, I, you know, through multiple emails or, or or attempts to reach out to them and not getting any kind of response. And I see that letter that uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation. I think that would be a good tool, but are they being educated that they are through the through the law required to participate in this? Yes, so it is in the statute as well as in the regulations. Um, I thought the, the letter may have citation for the where this in the statute where it's required to. So when so you may be, you you may be more than I mean you're more welcome more than welcome to uh, revise the letter to include the statutory citation. They are supposed to know it, um, you know, uh, their industry trade associations may have, um, maybe they don't know it. You're, you're right. They may not see that because that is in Section 303, which is part of the emergency response plan and what LEPCs have to do it. In that, it's buried in there, so they may not know. I mean, they're supposed to, uh, it is a responsibility, but yeah, I can help you, uh, you know, give you the, I'll, I'll give you the citation so you can maybe modify the letter to fit your needs and then you could point that out, that according to 
have course tied to section 303, blah, blah, blah. So I'll give you, I can give you the, the specific citation if you want to um, email me separately, or I can send it to Beth and O'Grady and they can send it out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So see, if you can send that to me, then I can distribute yeah. that when we send out the minutes. Could okay. you also clarify is, is for 303, I thought that only applied to facilities that had extremely hazardous substances. So yes. only those who have EHSs are required to attend the LEPC yes. meetings. The other facilities are encouraged, but it's really limited to those who have yes. EHSs. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah, that's that's <laughs> right. But um, you know, I think to again, yeah, it, it, it the hands are tied about what's what's in the statute. Even you request inform additional information from the facilities, again, the HS facilities, but Tim Gable House always says, no, they can request pretty much anything, but you know, but you can try it, you know, requesting facilities to join. But you know, some most of them like, you know, they may want for their publicity or for their goodwill, you should say, they may be able to participate. They may start participating. You know what I mean? So the early pieces can reach out. I mean, what's the worst thing they can say? No, right? But you can make them, right? And Trent, we have a facility newsletter that we send out every December that deals with EPCRA regulations and EPCRA updates. And mm -hmm. I can actually include an article uh, for this December about yeah. EHS's facilities being required to attend. It would be right. a good time to remind them. So right. I've made a note yeah. here to include that in our next newsletter. Oh, um, okay. And hopefully that'll help. Okay. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, and, and many many LEPCs are now uh, throughout the country are planning for all hazardous chemicals, not just EHS. I mean, you know, look at how many accidents ammonium nitrate was involved in, and that's not an EHS. It's an OSHA hazardous chemical. It created a lot of issues. But yeah, it's, EPCRA is an old statue, and you know, we wish that it would get revised because many times I feel like I want to rewrite the statue <laughs> because it's missing a lot of stuff. It needs a lot of fixes. So, um, and and then sometimes. You know, some of the exclusions are tied to other regulations, say OSHA regulations, or how they interpret certain things. And so, you know, it's 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 kind of difficult. But you know, Beth, when you when you do send that, are you do you send that because of the March to remind them about the F criteria two reporting requirements, or do you not, just send that? Not specifically to remind them, but more so because. We wanted the facilities to be up to date on mm. on things okay. and to have, you know, uh, different topics that would apply to those specific facilities. So okay. uh, the newsletter kind of changes every every year, but it always okay. includes, you know, an update from the CERC, uh, yeah. regulatory updates, any training opportunities that are available that we found out about. And then we have one called Voices from Industry, where the industry can request a specific topic to be covered. Nice. Um, okay. So it wasn't specifically with the intent to remind them about March 1st, but okay. uh, it does help tend to joggle their brain that, hey, that's coming up. So yeah. um, right. they, they seem to appreciate the the reminder and the and the updates. Okay. And you may want to include the, uh, the, EPRO, the video that, you know, that we posted. So, you know, some of them may not be aware of what EPRO is or what can happen if there's no prep, you know, prepping and planning from for chemical disasters. And I know that some some states are pushing for uh, LEPCs to focus on all hazards, but I always say that is all good and it's acceptable as long as the chemical emergency planning is part of their that plan. Because I always say chemicals they handle every minute and anything can happen and we don't want to Avoid disasters like Bhopal, you know, where, you know, 3,000 people died and, so, and thousands were permanently, dis, you know, injured. So we want to avoid those type of incidents. Our West Texas, where 12, 15 firefighters lost their lives, you know. So not, you know, we got to focus on LEPCs and the first responders to 
uh, look at the tier two reports and then have an idea what type of hazards each of the chemicals, you know, in certain facilities in their planning districts so that they can be prepared before walking into a situation that, you know, they can't avoid. You know what I mean? So, so I always, you know, promote that, you know, take a look at the uh, tier two data. I know that you guys have challenges with resources. So do we, unfortunately. I mean, we were our office manage the upgrade on 313 risk management program, support J, oil, SPCC, and uh, the new one, the um, clean water has clean water hazardous substances, uh, worst case discharge. That is also on our plate. So we are so limited with staff resources to begin with. After all these years, I was the only one managing the EPCRA program. So now we have, I have two junior staffs and they're, you know, just learning. So mentoring them as well. So you can see how our, you know, funding is spread very thin as well. Yeah. So, you know, um, but, you know, do you guys collect uh, tier two fees? The State Emergency Response Commission does not. Um, a couple of the LEPCs request a voluntary fee, uh, but not most of them do not require any fees um, um, currently. Okay. Well, that's another thing that, you know, we are encouraging states to think about because that fee, the, the fee can be used to manage several of the responsibilities that you guys have and then as well as the LEPCs. So several states and so all that information, like who, you know, which state has uh, tier two fees established and where they get their grant from. And and I think one or two states reported that uh, the facilities in their in their uh, state also provide some grant to the LEPCs to develop the plan. And so, I mean, they're lucky. I mean, you know what I mean? So, but we will include in that, you know, in that in the report, all that who has been doing a state profiles with that report. So, you know, we're going to ask all of you to review the information in there, make sure that we have the current information about, you know, what we collected from this in the search survey response. So anyways, um, yeah, so it's good. It's, it uh, looks like we got one final question um, mm -hmm. from, from Casey Rice, and she just asked, you made this answer, but would, would the state fee be in addition to the local county fee, which would not be the case if I'm correct. Um, um go ahead, Beth. I mean, you were going to answer that question. I was going to say, um, if if the state ever instituted a fee, it would be outside and separate from whatever the county fees are. But the state is not currently in the foreseeable future going to be requiring any fees that I know of. Um, but it would be separate or on top of whatever is already required by the county. Um, Sissy, thank you so much for your input and for your all, your hard work over these 30 years. I know it's been a long journey and we appreciate your advice and the handbook and everything that you've done here today. Uh, we are going to move on to our uh, next speaker, which is Hub Harvey with the um, Shelby County EMA. He's going to talk about the uh, pipeline incident and about the uh, LEPCs and how their group handled that. If anybody has any more questions for Sissy in the meantime, you can type them in the chat and we can circle back to that before we end. Um, and Is then, sorry. yes, ma'am, go ahead. Comment. Thank you for all your hard work, all of you. We really appreciate it. And it makes me happy that, you know, that whatever that I do is supported by all of you and, and thank you all. Thank you, Sissy. All right, Hub, uh, if you are going to share slides, there you go, you've already got it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute, and Hub, you can take us away. All right, I was trying to find my, da -da -da -da. should have a secondary screen. I'm just trying to find it here real quick. Okay. All right, uh, for some reason, it's disappeared to be able to see the, what's the next slide coming up but we will work around that. All right, so hey, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I know a lot of you that are on this call already. 
Um, I am uh, the former EMA director for Shelby County, Alabama. Um, I was offered a uh, opportunity to promotion for the county. So now I'm, my title, it's a chief officer level position, um, uh, juvenile and risk operations for the county. So I'm working with um, detention, juvenile probation, schools, a lot of different things with that. But the risk operations part of that is, is that I'm actually over, um, I'm the safety officer for the county, but I'm also one of my uh, three direct reports is the EMA director. So in a disaster, I roll right back in full time into EMA uh, until that is resolved. So I'm excited about the new position, but a lot of people have had questions. So I'm still here, haven't gone anywhere. I'm still here in the EMA office in the emergency operations center, still sitting at the same desk. So pipelines, who on earth wants a pipeline? Because people think about, you know what, it's um, it's a mess when something happens, but why, why would you want one? The, we all do when push comes to shove, because like airplanes, they are really, really great until something happens. When you talk about getting fuel from Houston, Texas to the Port of New York and Linden, New Jersey, it costs less than 10 cents per gallon to get a gallon of fuel from Houston all the way to New York. So um, if you think about that, what will be the environmental damage if you were shipping all that on 406 tankers at 9,000 gallons at a pop? Um, and the, the environmental impact would just be through the roof. So uh, you can't really start and talk about the 2016 pipeline leak without going back and doing a little bit of historical narrative. Uh, August 2014, we dealt for about three weeks with a release on one of our two pipeline companies that run through the county. This was actually a gasoline release that wound up taking us about three weeks to resolve that one. Then we had what we called the double oak release number two in February of 2016. This was actually one of three releases that took place during the calendar year of 2016. As you can see there on this one, it was unusual. Thankfully, so far, it's the only one that we had on what's called the distillate line. So this is act was actually jet fuel, diesel fuel, the uh, those type commodities that are actually passed on this line. <clears throat> this is one of those, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong because we had a situation with this that there's actually uh, a creek that we had to divert and had to build coffer dams. Then we had a five inch rain as soon as we got all that in place come through and wash out all of the dams, the coffer dams that we had set up. So this one was a real experience during the winter to figure it out and uh, just to be able to work with all the different parties and stay up to date on that. And so there's a few more looks at how um, all of the stuff that we would put in the creeks and different things, there's the flooding that happened. Uh, picture in the lower left hand corner of what was the coffer dam where it was blown out. Um, so you see what it did to boom and different things. So um, late uh, late 2016, we actually had two pipeline incidents that uh, because of the first one, we wound up with the second one. So the one that we called CR91 and where on earth did that come from? It's because the access point to the location was off of County Road 91 in Shelby County. That was September 9th, 2016, four point, about four and a half weeks of active uh, work out there on this particular incident. And on the the left picture, what you're looking at is, is that's approximately three feet of gasoline on a multi-acre lake. And then that's just a different angle of the shot on the right side that you're seeing there. Um, it was a, it turned out to be a very small crack in the pipeline. It never, um, never got to the point that it scrammed the systems. Their SCADA system never picked it up because it was just not enough difference that it dropped the percentage flow that the system said, uh-oh, we've got a problem, let's stop. So it was once we actually had product out collecting on this lake that we actually knew that we had a problem. And I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but here's how, how funny and interesting life can be on you. Colonial Pipeline every year does a unannounced exercise that is absolutely full scale. They bring hundreds of people into the area for these exercises that they do. And when we did this one, it was actually in 2015 and notice the date, uh, September 14th, 2015, September 9th, 2016, 
So if you can see my mouse on here, you're going to see where they point right there, on just a little bit to the right of the picture there. You're going to see a red dot, and that was the drill or exercise release point for this exercise. If you follow that dotted yellow black line, which is approximately where the pipeline runs, you go over here to the bottom left hand corner where my mouse is moving right now. That's where we had this leak. So uh, you can't make that up that in their materials that they put together, um, somebody needs to be placing bets or something because it was amazing at that they actually almost to the day, like 51 weeks later, actually you could see an actual release in the picture of the cover of the actual exercise that they presented. So here's the work that was done on that. And you can just see several different ways that this came about. Because of the high levels of benzenes that were in this area, it was so hot, we were not able to get in there and work on it um, efficiently, effectively. So they actually wound up having to put in a 1,000 foot, 36 inch diameter uh, bypass, like uh, around the actual site to be able to get out there and work on it. So because of this, and working on this, in the first 10 days, our instant command post was at the Pelham Civic Complex, and that was something to see because they took over an entire uh, ice skating rink in the area around it, and that still was not enough. We still had other rooms within their facility to be able to go and do things like unified command briefings. So for that first 10 days, it was 125 persons in the instant command post every 12 hour shift. Out in the field, there were 800, approximately 800 persons every 12 hour shift out there working. So because of this, October 31st, 2016, uh, we called this one CR 251 because it was right off of County Road 251. And what happened was is that there were Work was being done because they were getting ready to replace that thousand foot bypass on CR 91. And as a part of that, a company was out digging on the pipe and somehow uh, caught a threaded O ring or something. There was a release, there was an ignition, we had multiple fatalities, huge regional response. Um, this was a situation where we had a a large instant command post, but nothing the size of the one before because it was so localized uh, and then smaller field response. So I bring this up because uh, how many of you, I'm not sure ever watched the movie Sully about the miracle on the Hudson. And so this was probably the most fascinating part of this to me was that what you see in the top left corner can lead to what's in the top, in the bottom right hand corner. And that's uh, Captain Sullenberger and his co-pilot being interviewed uh, by the NTSB Survival Factors Working Group. Uh, I wound up being the local representative to the NTSB Survival Factors Working Group. And I gotta tell you, this was, it was truly fascinating because that role went on for years. And I was not allowed to mention, it was over three years that I was a part of that and was very limited on what I could say or share about pipelines. So literally, people were wanting me to speak uh, locally, nationally about pipeline response. And so I had to actually have a transcript of every word that I intended to say and have it uh, actually send it to the NTSB in Washington, D.C. for them to approve it. So all I was able to do with CR 251 for over three years was just say, we had a release uh, near County Road 251 in Shelby County. That was all I could say about it and move on. So if you find yourself in this situation, why? Why are LEPCs so important? Well, number one, it's relationships. But number two, NTSB on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m., they, they wanted documentation now. And the kind of documentation they wanted were emergency response plans, uh, the emergency operations plan for the county, emergency response plans for local fire departments, emergency response plans for the uh, companies that were involved in this. Um, they wanted training records. They wanted after action reviews from incident, from exercises that we had done, specifically from our LEPC, seven o'clock on a Saturday morning in the middle of all this, we're going back and making copies and scanning for them, copies of LEPC agendas, 
sign-ins, sign-in sheets and minutes going back for like four years before that incident happened. So part of this is um, EPA, great friend of friends of ours, uh, love working with them, extremely professional. Um, and so unfortunately we've gotten to know them uh, through actual experience uh, rather than exercises, but there's a lot of information you can find out on that epaosc.org website. So here you can see what we actually called um, the CR91 incident, and then here is actually the CR251 incident. So again, a lot of information there. You can see epaosc.org slash CR251 pipeline fire will get you to that information. So one thing that I would like to address for everybody involved with this is public information. So when we had these last two incidents, we had a situation where Colonial Pipeline had uh, hired a local PIO firm, then they had a PIO firm that coordinated with the locals out of their headquarters in Atlanta. Then they also had PIOs based out of Washington, D.C., working with elected officials then they also kind of had POs working out of uh, Houston, Texas. So one thing was is that they we talked about a lot and they kept saying was it's got to be one message, one voice. And I'm going to repeat that again. One message, one voice. I disagreed with that then. I disagree with it today. And it took experience for them to get where I was coming from on this. Because again, we're talking about four and a half weeks, three weeks, two weeks, that we're having 7 a.m., 7 p.m. unified command briefings. And so myself and my staff are there for those meetings. So we're there at the incident command post most days, 14 hours a day. Here's the problem. When um, there absolutely needs to be one unified message coming out of unified command, and you want as much information as possible to come out of that one voice standing um, standing in front of a microphone, sharing with others surrounding them. But the issue that we ran into was none of our local, um, none of our local press knew any of those PIOs that were here from other companies or that had been hired to come in like out of Atlanta, Houston, those type areas. So what happened when we all go walking out just to take a break or something or to leave at the end of the day, here's a whole line of television cameras and here's all these local reporters. Well, they're not calling any of those POs by name, but they're going, hey, Hub, hey, Hub, come here, come here, come here. So that uh, so at some point there is going to be more than one voice, but that's why I push it back to if you ever find yourself in these type of situations, you've got to go back to that one unified message, but it may be more than one voice because all of these people at the end of these left and went back home. I'm still here as the PIO for Shelby County, talking with these people, trying to work with these people. So I've got to have that one message ready to go, but they've got to understand at the same time that it's a situation that we've got to, we've got to live with these people after you leave for years to come. Let's make sure that it's one unified message. So finally, LEPC relationships for us that are huge. Uh, our LEPC meets quarterly, the second Tuesday of the second month of the quarter. So that's like the next one is coming up in November. Everybody knows those dates, knows that rolling thing. Um, and we're going to have 30 to 50, sometimes more than 50 people at each one of our LEPC meetings. But we'll have, we're so blessed that uh, State EMA will send several people to ours. ADEM, uh, Grady, thank you for sending your people uh, to come to our LEPC meetings. Uh, Forestry Commission, uh, Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, we have the bulk of our first responder agencies, including law enforcement, EMS, fire will respond, but we've had uh, EPA and others attending our LEPC over the years, but we're very, very blessed with the responsible parties that come and show up. We have, I believe at last count, over 108 tier two facilities in the county. We have numerous ones that have extremely hazardous substances, uh, but the biggest thing that I want to leave with you right now is uh, well, one more thing about our LEPCs is we use those to review our hazard mitigation plan every uh, February uh, in, in like 
May of every year, we review our emergency operations plan with them. We work with them to do full scale exercises. Uh, and I like how Sissy put that, that it's not just hazardous materials exercises, but we will actually, we're working through the LEPC on, uh, because of what happened in Uvalde, Texas, we're actually using, because it's such a great diverse group that's gathered together, we're using that as an opportunity to be able to work on a full scale active shooter exercise sometime in the spring. So two things that I want to leave you with is when disaster strikes or opportunity knocks, it's too late to prepare. And one other thing from my buddy John Maxwell, if you prepare today, you probably don't have to repair tomorrow. That's all I got. Any other questions or any questions? Hey, Hub, I, just a quick question regarding your LAPCs. I know y'all do have a very robust one. And I know a lot of LA, other LAPCs actually look to y'all for some of that guidance. Um, but as far as your industry, and you said you have quite a few, and we all know you have quite a few in Shelby County. What is that industry turnout like at the meeting? Are, are they really supportive of that? I know I understand you're not going to always get every one, but uh, particularly your EHSs. And then um, do you have Colonial? Are they ever able to make it out? to your uh, LEPC meetings? Excellent question, Grady. Uh, every meeting, Colonial Pipeline is going to have someone there. Um, Plantation, Kinder Morgan, Southeastern Pipeline Products, that uh, the name for them unfortunately keeps changing, but um, they will have people there at least once a year. Gaston Steam Plant, Alabama Power is going to have someone there every time. Colonial Pipeline at least once a year is going to sponsor our meeting. Then uh, our November meeting is always sponsored by Gaston Steam Plant here in Shelby County. So again, Grady, we are we have a really good representation. I'm proud of what we've got. Honestly, it's standing on the shoulders of giants because it's what uh, Don and Mindy started more than 10 years ago before I got here. But uh, we do really we're really pleased with the representation we will get, especially from those EHS uh, entities. They will show up and they are there. Any more questions for uh, Harvey? All right, with that, well, we certainly do appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, we've been waiting quite a while to to hear that, and uh, that's what I was telling everybody for you able to come on. There was some litigation and different things you had to work through before we could share that. We appreciate you finally coming and and uh, Kevin and giving us some insight on that. And I, I will always remember those incidents when I got that second one about it. it was actually Halloween, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, close to it. and I, I I was wondering was this a joke because uh, it was the same pipeline same everything but it turned out to be just what it was so uh, yes, it forget. literally Grady literally it was October 31st 2016 Perfect. it was yeah. Halloween night and Halloween. Uh, you weren't the only one that reacted that way and I'll just tell you I am ecstatic uh, that the NTSB all that part of this is behind us now because uh, I love talking about this stuff and trying to warn people but um you're right it hadn't been that long that i've been able to actually freely talk about it as i want to oh, we appreciate you sharing that with us and so we'll go right into the agency roundtable and this just kind of give i want to give every agency a chance to kind of uh speak if you have something you want to share i do want to stress this you know this is the cert but necessarily have to deal with only EPCRA or only LEPC or only hazardous material response. It can be, you know, if you have anything in that realm coming up within your agency that you like to share, any dates, any um, exercises, anything that would uh, just be a good notice to put out, or if you have anything internally happen within your agency that you'd like to share, now would be the opportunity to do so. So I'll turn it over to Beth, however you want to operate that. Sure. I've got a couple of names here that I don't have an agency with, so we'll start by seeing if they're still on the call and letting me know which agency you're with. Um, let's see. I have Christina Trailer. Can you unmute your mic and let me know what agency you're with, please? All right, we'll try Lee Blake. Okay. 
Owen Betts. Owen was with us, Beth. This is Pam. He's with Alabama EMA. Okay, thank you, Pam. And then Sandy Ebersol. She may be off the call already. I think Sandy yeah, is with USGS. Oh, wait, no, there she was. What'd you say, Sandy? I'm so sorry. I would say that was probably me. I was saying that Sandy is with uh, GSA. Oh, okay. And then um, I wanted to ask specifically, uh, Christy Barrett is with Red Cross. Christy, are you still on the line? All right. Um, those are all the names I have on my end. Um, does anybody want to do an update? We were hoping to hear from, I didn't know if anybody was from public health was on the line, if they wanted to do a brief update on either COVID or the monkeypox situation. Um, I reached out to a few agencies to encourage them to speak at the agency roundtable, and um, a few of them seemed interested. So I was hoping we'd get more feedback from today, but um, if you have any training opportunities or just any sort of update, we'd love to hear from all the agencies present. Um, so if nobody says anything, we'll conclude the meeting. Um, Grady will give closing comments, but um, does anybody want to say anything on behalf of their agency before we close? Hey, Beth and Grady, this is Paul Smelly with DHR. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed Hub's presentation and based on that, I think uh, the next time we have a major EMA exercise, I think that would be a good inject if there is a Columbia pipeline problem. Um, I think that would be a good way for some agencies that don't have a very active role during the exercise to respond to something, especially next year's hurricane exercise. Uh, you know, that, huh, that'd be quite a kink in our plans, but I do think it would help us have some more realistic training. That's just a thought. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, Paul. Thanks for sharing that. And, and an example would be, you know, every, when we do the winter weather exercise with AEMA hosts every year with all the state partners. You know, that's one thing as, as far as, say, with ADEM, we're kind of in the, in the infrastructure side with our drinking water systems and wastewater systems. And that's a lot of times what we focus on. But, you know, one thing that we come across often is when roads begin to freeze over, um, trucks begin to wreck and, uh, can be anything from uh, small diesel fuel during the middle of this this winter weather event, or you know something as large as a tanker, you know, hauling some type of extremely hazardous substance. So those are always things we try to play into that as well. So I would encourage any agency, you know, think think outside of just the winter weather exercise and what are things that could um, throw monkey wrenches in that response. Because I can assure you, responding to a spill in a winter weather storm. Is a lot different than responding to one when it's 80 degrees sunny day. All right, anyone else, any other agency have anything you'd like to share or update at this point? All right, well, hearing none, I just do, I do want to thank everyone again for taking time out of the morning to come and join us for this. Uh, we're always busy as state agents. We understand that. I've been in Clanton once this week already, probably be back next week, and we're working closely with them. And I know all agencies are being pulled different directions, but this is an important uh, commission and we want everyone to stay tuned into it. Uh, it's here for a reason. And I think Sissy Ann uh, Hub illustrated that well today. So thank you for being here and we will have uh, upcoming months uh, update our notifications on the next CERC meeting when it is planned. So, barring any comments, thank you all very much, and this will conclude the meeting.